Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Global Radio and TV Live, and I am your host, Dr. Ravi. The number to call is 469-307-1642-1642. I would like to thank our viewers in the United Kingdom. That's number one uh, audience we have, United Kingdom, followed by USA, India, Morocco, United Arab Emirates, Canada, Thailand, Japan, Ukraine, China, Korea, Israel, and Iraq. Hope uh, if I haven't heard from you, please let us know so we can add you to that uh, important list. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you know, you know very well that what we do in this show, we talk about conspiracy theories and controversial topics. I, as a scientist, would like to make sure that all topics are scientifically based. Sometimes they are not, but, you know, emotions get in the way, so things don't work. But we discussed here the existence of God. Hey, nothing more controversial than that topic. And uh, aliens, not the illegal aliens, but uh, the actual aliens that uh, exist among us. JFK assassination. You know, I am from Dallas. Uh, that's a big topic over here. All are controversial topics and conspiracy theories. And there are always two sets, uh, two sides, so, you know, firm believers and uh, extreme skeptics. Now, today our topic is a departure from the usual. And the topic is usually... Uh, the topic today is usually very boring for those who don't have any money. But if you do, if you have some money left, perhaps you want to pay attention to what to do with all that money. Now, you know, Oscar Wilde once said that anyone who lives within their means suffers from a lack of imagination, right? So it's naturally, you know, uh, uh, you know when you have saved all that money, <coughs> either you can live within your imagination or perhaps invest in stocks and bonds. Now, when you do this, do you go through a stock broker or you do on your own investing? You know, Woody Allen, many years ago in one of his movies said that uh, a stock broker is someone who invests your money until it is all gone. Okay, that's what Woody Allen said. But anyway, today's uh, our featured guest is uh, Douglas Goldstein, who had spent a better part of uh, 20 years advising people in Israel as well as in the U.S. and various parts of the world uh, what to do with their money and he has a great financial insights. So Douglas, welcome to Global Radio and TV Live. Ravi, real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Most welcome. So uh, let's, let's get to the, our uh, geographical uh, anchoring. So first let's start with you. Where are you now? I am in Israel right now. Okay. I was last week in New York and about three weeks ago I was in Switzerland. Very good. So, people, you know, you have been to all the places where people have a lot of money. <laughs> Listen, I'll tell you, I think one of the things that, one of the mistakes that a lot of people make is believing that if they don't, they believe if they don't have a lot of money, there's nothing to talk about. And quite frankly, I'm not quite sure about that. I really think that people need to realize that just because they may not have a big nest egg yet, that doesn't mean they can't build it. And literally, with just a few dollars a day, a person can build up over the long term a substantial amount of savings. Okay, so you are saying that uh, even if you are making a meager living, and uh, and you know if you save a few bucks now and then, or on a regular basis, small amount of money, uh, you are better off than most people. Is that is that what you are saying? I think that's true. And one of the things that I've realized is when I talk about this with people, oftentimes they'll say, no, not possible. You know, how could uh, 10 or 20 a day make a difference? Right? And how could I save any money? And one of the things that we realize is that you just need to believe that you can do it, change the way that you're looking at your life, and then you'll begin to be able to get on the path to success. I'm not even talking about investing. I'm just talking about changing your bad financial habits and making them good financial habits. Okay, now, uh, Doug, Doug, let's go back to you. you go back to your uh, personal uh, situation. Uh, I would imagine, since you are traveling f between, you are now, you know, you are continent hopping. I would imagine you are doing well for yourself. That's okay. That's that's good news. Uh, the second news is the second good question is. 
um, how did you first of all get into this business and secondly um, what is your expertise what do you do exactly and what do you are you an advisor are you a stockbroker or are you a financial planner what do you do exactly the great question and I'm actually impressed that you ask that question simply because most people don't even understand that there is a difference between uh, between those different fields. But uh, let me just give you the, the one minute background. I started on Wall Street I uh, over 20 years ago. In fact, I used to work in the Twin Towers. May they rest in peace. I was partners with my mother, who at the time had been a vice president at a, a major investment company on Wall Street. And she and I worked with our clients together. And in fact, the amazing thing is that my mother's mother was one of the first women to be licensed as a stockbroker in America. So I have been involved in the world of money management for generations. Perfect. So, you know, that's very good. Your mother's mother, your grandma was uh, the first woman to be qualifying as a stockbroker in New York one Stock Exchange. Things. One of the first ones. Uh, that is uh, that is uh, quite a feat, and uh, you must be proud of your your grandma there. <laughs> I hope she's proud of me. <laughs> is she still alive? No, she passed away. She she was there to watch me pass all of my exams to become. So now, me a second question. There are many different titles that people have in the world of money, and I think it's important for investors to understand the difference. And sometimes people like me may have multiple licenses or multiple titles and it's it's good to understand what the differences are i originally started my first license was that of a stockbroker which simply meant that i was allowed to talk to people about buying and selling stocks and i could handle that for them then i eventually got an insurance license which subsequently have i've given up i don't really deal in insurance anymore i don't sell insurance to people and mostly, uh, though I have many licenses, I won't bore you with the details, but the, the one that people normally are most interested in is that I have, I'm registered as what's called a certified financial planner, a CFP. And so I spend a lot of time uh, helping people develop financial plans and then executing them by opening brokerage accounts for clients in the United States. You know, Ravi, these days, af especially after 9-11, it's difficult for people who live outside the United States to open accounts inside the United States. Talk about conspiracy theories. We can we can touch on that if you want. Uh, but yeah, it's very definitely. difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, our, that's our specialty is helping people who live outside the United States open a U.S. brokerage account so they can invest in the U.S. Okay. The, the most important thing you are saying at the very beginning, okay, save your money. And by saving you are going to increase your net worth. Now, one thing that I got to tell you, that the best way to double your money is to just to fold it and put it in your pocket. <laughs> okay. Well, this is something, and I, let me tell you who said this. I, I forgot who said it. And it, it, says, <laughs> it says anonymous. So, so I, I won't he, take he, was, he said a lot of good stuff. <laughs> anonymous said a lot of good stuff, yes. So give us, give our audience, you know, they are coming to the end of the year. You know, we are going to talk about the year-end uh, planning as well because we are at the end. You know, it, it will be a very interesting conversation if you do the same thing in before April 15th. You may have some ideas as to how to uh, not cheat the IRS, but <laughs> save some planning. Okay, but the year-end, we are coming to the year-end. Uh, you want to save money, and uh, what strategies they should employ, considering that they are towards the end of the year. Now, the, I, I think right. Christmas and um, Hanukkah and everything else is coming, right? So, That's right. So, That's therefore, right. therefore now there is nowhere to save any money. So, tell our audience, anyway, starting the first of the year, what, what they should do. Well, the first thing is before the first of the year, you know they always say that about gifts, it's the thought that counts, not the amount of money you spend, right? You've heard that? Right. So, to all of your loved ones, tell them, I'm thinking about you and save the money. <laughs> That's it? <laughs> no gifts? <laughs> I, I could save you a lot of money. Listen, I think the question, the way you're phrasing it is very good because you're asking about strategy. And one of the areas that I really like to focus on a lot, in fact, I, I just wrote a book about this, the strategies of dealing with money. And in fact, you and I have something very, very much in common, which is um, our, uh, let's say, our, our backgrounds of with great chess players from our countries because um, Vishy Anand was the five-time world chess champion. 
and uh, just played recently. And I'm very involved in the chess world. In fact, the book that I wrote was written with a former world chess champion, Susan Polgar, about how the strategies of chess can be applied to investing. So when I'm looking for strategies, normally I'll turn to chess in order to find the, the theme. And that's what I use to help people to develop their investment strategies as well. You know, there are several different strategies one would use in chess, like uh, Sicilian defense or, you know, a ho whole lot of uh, postures. Um, and also the most important thing about chess is that you have to figure out what are the different moves the other parties are going to do. In other words, how the stock market, the business, the government, the tax, everything are involved in this. So are you saying that you need to just not look at... Uh, and uh, you know, folding the money and put it in your pocket. Instead, you need to look at all the other factors that are surrounding financial management. Well, I'll tell you about something that happened when I was writing the book with Susan Polgar. We used to meet, because uh, we both travel quite extensively, and we used to meet in, uh, in Starbucks, in different cities. That was our general meeting place. And, and so often we would pull out a chessboard, because that was the, the basis of our ideas. And... Uh, Occasionally, we would play a game as well. And I remember one of the games we played, I actually thought I was doing pretty well. I had set up my pieces. I was moving in towards the checkmate. I had my queen pretty close to her king, and I was, I was really thinking of a way that I could finish her off. And what happened? A minute later, her bishop swoops in mm -hmm. and captured my queen. Mm -hmm. And within about two moves, she said to me, Doug, checkmate. And I was so, you know, I did one of these, knocking my, how could I have missed it? And she smiled and she said, you know something, Doug, you have to look at the whole board. Yeah. And that was the critical lesson. Uh, Ravi, that's just what you've been saying now is you have to look at all the pieces on the board and not just at one little thing. Oh, see, that's very interesting. My father was a chess grandmaster and uh, he used to play against, uh, you know, 15 guys sitting there. And he pretty much, f 14 out of 15 get beaten. So me and my brother, we used to play against him. You know, he, he passed away many years ago, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, rest in peace. Uh, we never was able to beat him. Not even a one single game in our entire life, we couldn't beat him. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, of course, he was, he, he was good. You know, anyway, I, nobody, I never brought this subject up until you came along and told me about chess. Um, if that is the case, if you have to look at many different aspects and everything else, how do you help? You know, let's let's start with uh, somebody who has, uh, say, hundred thousand dollars, and he says, "Okay, I I want to uh, retire in five years." Uh, what kind of things can they do in this economy with the interest rate being so low, and there is uncertainty in market? Nobody knows what's going to happen, and people are wondering when the third world war is going to break out. So all, and especially in, in your ne neck of the wood there, in your neighborhood, there's all kinds of uncertainties. You know, you know how, do you, how do you make sense out of all this? You know, give us our chess an analogy now. So I think that one of the things you have to realize is that prophecy and prayer are not really good models for choosing investments because no one has prophecy. And it's not obvious to me that your praying is going to make a difference in the, in the stock market. There are aspects, however, that you can control. And I think it's the same thing on the chessboard, which is, you know, one of the mistakes that amateur chess players make is they'll say, oh, I'll move here and I just hope that my opponent doesn't see it. So that works great when you're playing against a four-year-old. But when you're playing against a grandmaster, she's going to see everything. She really does see the whole board. Right. And that's certainly one of the experiences that I've had playing with Susan. In fact, I've had that experience playing with my children. I, I taught them to play chess, but ultimately they surpassed me and they became champions. But I think that the, uh, that the lesson that, that you can take from chess is, is realizing that y you need to control the parts you can control. For example, you can control your opening. You can control... Let's go over a, a, just a basic te chess technique, and this is not even for chess players. If you don't play, it doesn't even matter. But one of the main things that chess players learn is you should try to get control of the center of the board. You should move your middle pawns into the middle. That's a, a normal opening that, that the chess player is going to work on. Another opening position a grandmaster will do, and even an amateur player will do, is that he's going to try to get his fighting pieces, like his bishops and his knights, 
also into the middle of the game. He's not going to let them sit in the back row for the whole game. And finally, he's going to castle. He's mm. going to try and castling is a move that ultimately is designed to protect your king. So with those three critical opening moves in mind, you can actually then begin to realize other important steps that you have to take in order to manage your money the same way. Very interesting. Now, there, there is interesting, another, another important factor I want to talk to you about. You know, in chess, you have the fool's mate. Remember, you move the pawn in front of the king and then move the bishop and the queen. If the other party also does the same thing, you have immediate quick fool's mate or okay. fool's checkmate. Now, whenever I invested money in stock market, I ended up as the fool's mate. Okay. <laughs> Within you don't very, have much very, luck there, buddy, do you? Very, very quickly. Well, I, I, I did very well in chess, okay, and I was pretty <laughs> good. But it, when, when it, when it's trying to translate that information to actual fin in, you know, financial investment, I was a fool, okay. Now, naturally, I made a lot of mistakes, I'm sure, and usually I lost money rather quickly. It didn't take much time to lose money. Now, I thought, hey, wait a minute, I might as well gone to the horse track and put this money rather than trying to do this. Okay, even though we had all kinds of great strategies and everything else. Tell our audience, is there any quick way of making money? You could marry money. You, you could marry advice. money. Yeah, there you go, it's guys. Yeah. There is a great advice. Maybe next next time I need the next reincarnation, I need to marry somebody with money. <laughs> so, no, I, I don't think. I, I don't listen the same way. When you're playing chess against a little child, that's one thing. But when you're playing chess in the real world, the tournament world, that's the same thing as investing on Wall Street. The people you're up against, they're also professionals. So don't try to think, oh, I can make a fool's checkmate on my opponent because he's not going to notice something. It's not true. It doesn't happen on Wall Street. And if people tell you stories like that, either it's one in a million or they're just making it up or often they're only talking about a very, very small part of their overall portfolio which is also a, a huge mistake. You have to look at everything. If someone says, well, I bought ABC stock and look how much money I made. Well, okay, but tell me about all the other stocks you bought and the bonds and the mutual funds. How did you do overall? Did you win the game? So don't fall into the hype the same way that a chess player wouldn't fall into a hype, into the hype that you can win instantly. It doesn't happen. Don't even try for it. All you're doing is setting yourself up for failure. Okay, yeah, it's... Absolutely, you are right. You know, yeah, actually, the way it, it was the other way around. It was not that I was trying to, you know, fool fool mate somebody. Instead, it happened to me. I was fooled. Uh, well, anyway, that's because of my foolishness getting into an area that I did not have any clue. Ladies and gentlemen, most important thing from what I so far heard is, don't try this on you know in, on your home by yourself. <laughs> get a <laughs> get a proper financial advice. Okay, well, that's is, a good that's a good is, point. That's one of that's one of the topics, in fact, that we spoke about when Susan and I, when we were in Switzerland a couple of weeks ago, we were talking to a conference of money managers and family office direct, family office is a type of company that handles all of the money needs for what we often call ultra high net worth families or ultra high net worth individuals. These are the people who are worth tens or hundreds of millions of dollars and they, they have whole offices to handle their their portfolio. So Susan and I were speaking to these groups, to these, to these directors and these money managers, and one of the things we said is exactly what you just said. Even for them, they need to have a coach or they need to have an advisor or a mentor or a partner, someone that they can bounce the ideas off of because otherwise what happens is you move too quickly and you end up, you know, you end up touching the fire and getting burned. Well, you know, ultra high net worth individuals, um, the question is, what do you consider as ultra high worth? Ten million, hundred million. Only, I think we'd be talking about families of ten million dollars and above. And above, okay. Well, you know, there was a, there was another quote. This is I thought was very interesting. Every day I get up and look through the Forbes list of the richest people in America. If I am not there, I get to work. <laughs> okay, and so, if you are there, you probably are working too. Don't get well. If you are there, still you have to get to work because otherwise, otherwise you lose it. Right. Okay. Yeah, you have to yeah, watch you, it very carefully. Watch it very carefully. It's actually sometimes easier to make money than to keep it. Could be. I, I haven't seen an academic study on that, but it's certainly a good lesson, even if it's not uh, st statistically true that people 
do need to protect their wealth. Listen, a lot of the work that I do in my day job as a financial advisor is I'll talk to clients about how to structure their portfolio, not just in terms of what types of money managers to have handle it or what sorts of bonds to buy, but we look at tax-efficient strategies. We look at estate planning so that when they die, how's the money going to be distributed according to their wishes? Okay, so when you, when we you know we haven't we touched on it, but we never finished it. So if somebody comes to you and say, "Hey, I have hundred thousand dollars, and I would like to retire in five years. And I w- is it possible to double the money? Um, what kind of advice you will ask her? You will tell her." Yeah. So the first thing I would start to do would be to actually put down a financial plan. I think that having the ideas in writing is what's going to make it it possible to follow. Listen, if you go to any business or you go to a startup company, they're going to have a business plan. And the financial plan, the personal financial plan is the business plan for your home company, you know, your home team, whatever you want to call it, me incorporated or my family incorporated. We have to have a plan for how we're going to get from where we are today to where we want to be. And one of the most useful things I think an advisor might be able to tell you is whether your goal is reasonable or whether it's just wishful thinking that's not possible. So if you have $100,000 and plan to retire in New York in five years, unless you're only planning to live for about six months, I don't think that's a reasonable plan. But if you've decided you're going to move to the Far East or to South America, then maybe that is enough to work with. Well, even within America, you can go to places where it's not going to be that expensive, right? Maybe. Maybe. I suppose each person is going to have his own level of lifestyle. And that's, well, and that's part of the plan, is okay. you want a customized plan for yourself. That's why on a, this sort of radio show format, there's no rule of thumb what everyone should do. The, 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 the number one thing is to, I'll tell you, the number one thing that people have to do is figure out where they are today. And I, I know this may seem so basic, but Ravi, you have no idea how many times people come into my office and I ask them basic questions like, what's the value of your portfolio? What's the value of your retirement plan? How much insurance do you have? And they have no idea. Uh, you know, if you want, I'll give you something, a, a free tool that people can use that maybe will help out. Would, is, is now a good time for that? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So in writing the book with Susan Polgar... Can you show the book to our audience? Do you have it? Sure. And also tell our audience where you can, where they can find it. Yeah, that's a big, huge book. How many pages? It's a little. Un, it's two hundred ninety-eight pages. I think. Wow, three hundred pages. Yeah, with an index. So it's actually the book itself is about two hundred and sixty pages. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, there it is. Uh, um, Rich as a king. All right, go ahead. Tell wis- our audience where can. Right. It's called Rich as a King: How the Wisdom of Chess Can Make You a Grandmaster of Investing. And on the front here, if you, you can, by the way, you can get it on Amazon or your favorite bookstore. We're very proud that we have an endorsement for the book. We have many endorsements, but one of them is from Michael Spence, who won the Nobel Prize in economics. So very, he, he took a look at our book and, and gave us a, a pat on the back. So I think uh, that's, right? that's absolutely incredible. That is that validates uh, all the work you have done. Pretty good. Yeah, it was very nice. Okay. Well, I'm just looking at the back. Also, Ken Rogoff, who was the former chief economist of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and, by the way, a professor of economics at Harvard University, and, most importantly, a chess grandmaster. He also said he liked the book. <laughs> so we were, we were pretty happy about that. Very good. Anyway, so- but I wanted to give you something for free, or you know, give all your listeners. In the book, we, we refer to certain secret pages on our website. So I'll tell you one of them that, uh, that I think you'll like, which will help everyone. This is across the board is going to help everyone to improve fu- the, uh, you know, his and her finances. If you go to the website for the book, which is www.richasaking.com forward slash snapshot. So it's richasaking.com slash snapshot. There's a free online tool that we built that's designed to help people to literally get a snapshot of where they are today. And I think it is probably the most complete online tool you can use that will help you to, to, uh, to figure out where you are today in order to be, have a starting point for how to manage your portfolio. Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here. Richasaking.com forward slash snapshot and then go to the 
uh, online uh, tool and there you can get a snapshot of you know fill, fill in the blanks and you will get a snapshot of uh, what is your current status is very good okay now coming back to you know something else which is very interesting you, you talked about um, uh, how to make quick bucks number one marry somebody with money number two of course it may be long shot but it might work for one out of 200 million buy a good yeah, don't do it i was just kidding by the way <laughs> i know one guy who did it and then ended up as a disaster so well I, I, you know, wait, wait, i'm also joking you know the other option is to go and buy a lottery but you know sometimes you know what you they know, call a lottery by the way yeah what well, do they the call? lottery is a poor man's tax poor man's tax Cause <laughs> i i because generally people who play first off no one you know except the one in a gazillion who wins no one wins that means that all these people who have this dream of winning they're playing and that means they are paying so that someone out the lottery who is going to win and some guy's going to win some money and most people lose and most of the people who play can't afford to play yeah well you know there was another another statement here it says that the, he who marries for love without money without money has great nights and sorry days okay <laughs> <laughs> okay all right anyway let's let's go back and continue our conversation but we need to take a quick break and uh, you know ladies and gentlemen you all realize that uh, this is a this show is a musical show so we tried our best to figure out how do we introduce any kind of music in this so naturally it was very hard but you know since we are going to take a break we are going to put some music in there and we will be back in two minutes uh, and uh, Doug please stay on the line ladies and gentlemen we will be right back now you'll have a say in how my company spends I have the ends for the mower and we're both making dividends Our company is kind of like a building building stocks are the bricks of the building building if you want a brick you own part of it Stocks are sold on the stock market. A company is kind of like a pie. pie. A stock is a slice that you buy. Why? Because if the pie is popular to eat, then the slice is worth more on the street. Sweet. Now, if you buy some stocks, you will own some shares of the companies you pick. But please beware. Of what? The market is tricky. Stocks can be risky. Pay a high price, and they can drop quickly. Ooh. Swiftly, sonny, you can lose lots of money. If businesses struggle, it can get ugly. So trust me, it's best to do your research before you spend cash. You should read first. Okay. All about the company and of its history. Products and owners should never be a mystery. How much they earn versus how much they owe. It's called net worth. And it's something you should know or realize prices rise and fall be cool stay in for the long haul before you sell shares stick to your vision to make wise tested investment decisions a company is kind of like a building building stocks are the bricks of the building building if you want to break you own part of it Stocks are sold on the stock market. A company is kind of like a pie. pie. A stock is a slice that you buy. Why? Because if the pie is popular to eat, then the slice is worth more on the street. Sweet. You've been checking the paper, reading the news, perusing the computer, looking to choose a company or two that you think will do well. You see a new shoe brand that's starting to sell. Ah. So you call up the guy who buys and sells stocks. Hello. Sometimes he'll advise what to buy or not. He's a stockbroker. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Global Radio and TV Live. And you are listening to our featured guest, uh, Douglas Goldstein. Douglas, uh, welcome back. Thank you. A great song you chose there, Ravi. I've never heard it before. Well, I never heard it before either. But, you know, we do our research <laughs> and then uh, look for some songs. You know, the YouTube is the greatest thing nowadays. You can find almost anything there, including, you know, whatever else. Anyway, coming back to one of the things that people are very afraid of, especially in, in America. Now, I'm I'm pretty sure the... Uh, the problem is not going to go away anytime soon, and it is going to affect across the board whether a high net worth individual or uh, you are a poor peasant. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, it is be primarily because of the government. The government is going to mess everything else up for us. Now, right now, we are running an $18 trillion de deficit. And if this deficit continues, we, nobody knows where Sorry, it just went up a billion dollars since you started. Oh, it's just I started the course a billion dollars. My goodness. So well, since you started part two of the show, I think. <laughs> so now, you see, you know, here is my problem. Now, I'm going to make a very bold statement. The deficit is no big deal. And we do, should not be worried about deficit. Now, I'm going to give you some reasons, but I ask you this. From, from as a financial planner, looking at that the government has a significant role to play in the economy of a country and the economy of the whole world, especially the U.S. government, and they are running this big, huge tab 
like this and continuously it's going up you know as you said in the last uh, 30 minutes it's went up by billion dollars how do you reconcile the fact that uh, the future looks pretty bleak because the government guys are going to screw this up for everybody else well first of all let me point out that you what you're saying is supported by none other than Nobel Prize winner Paul Krugman who believes that having the debt it, and he would certainly say that since the the uh, administration has taken on more debt over the past few years, they've actually been able to dig the economy out of the, the terrible hole that it was in 2007, 2008. And so th there's certainly two sides to this story. I tend to look at it from a different angle, which is the type of debt that normal people should have. So we can talk about the government policies, and I'm happy to go over that a little bit. But it seems to me as though, first of all, the, the biggest problem with the government having debt is the example that they're teaching to the American people, which is it's okay to borrow and borrow and borrow and just hope you'll be able to pay it back tomorrow. The U.S. government has a printing press that they can print money, so it's a little bit easier for them to pay it back than, let's say, for you and me. But I would encourage everyone listening today to focus on lowering their debt to zero. And I'm talking about credit card debt and payday debt and automobile debt and student debt. Get it down to zero and start actually building up a positive net worth. You are well, very good. So what you are saying is uh, the government can print its, print its own money and therefore uh, they are in a much better position than you and I. Uh, when we have to take a loan and, uh, and, and we have to pay it back. Um, well, then, in, 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 therefore, you know, one of the things that I read about, that the, you said Paul Krugman said that uh, the government debt um, is, uh, is, is less dangerous? Well, he, he said, it was based on his advice, that the government took on and continues to take on so much debt because he said you needed that to stimulate the economy. Okay, so st when it comes to stimulating the economy, it is good. And as a matter of fact, we were able to dig ourselves out of this mess from 19 in, in 2008 because of the government was pumped a lot of money into the banks and and other loans and savings and other 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 institutions. Now, uh, if that is the case, um, we should not be worried too much about this foreign debt. For example, I was thinking. For example, let me give you an example. I go to the Chinese guy, our Chinese government. And I tell them, listen, just go ahead and um, sell me a printer. And they say, okay, we'll sell you a printer. I'll just put it on my account. I'll pay you shortly. And the only agreement I have is I will pay him in U.S. dollars. And I am I am Uncle Sam, by the way. So the Chinese uh, guy says, okay, he sends me the printer. Then I say, listen, I need one more little loan. Just send me some papers. And then he sends me some papers. And what I do, okay, how much I owe you? You owe me $200,000. So I take his paper, I take his printer, and print that $200,000 and send it to him. And that's what the U.S. government is doing, right? I, I'm assuming you're bringing up China because the kind of the myth that people have, which they believe that China owns all the debt of the U.S. government. Not necessarily that. You see, as a matter of fact, the Americans had the preeminent position of making the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency for all transactions between not only America and other countries, but also among the other countries. Now, this happened in the 40s and 50s when America was in preeminent position of a global financial giant. Now, in, two, in, in 1970s, uh, uh, Richard Nixon came along and he said, well, we are not going to tie these U.S. dollars to Fort Knox gold reserve. And it, that was, that was de decoupled, right? Now, what you have is a bunch of paper. Now you don't. In the American government has does not have to guarantee that for all the dollars out there in the world, it has to show gold. It doesn't have to show that anymore. So what I am saying is, now what? Not only the Americans were able to convince the their part trading partners, but also all other trading partners among themselves to use American currency as reserve currency to convince. meet their debts. Correct. I don't know if it's convincing. You feel free to use whatever currency you want, but. <laughs> the fact is that the world markets hold that the U.S. dollar has been for decades and decades, for many, <laughs> as long as I can remember, and even longer than that, has been the reserve currency. You know, no one's quoting the price of gold in 
in ruples or in rupees or in in uh, euros for that matter. Right. Okay. So the American debt is not a big deal. All they do is just print a bunch of paper and. No, no I'm not thrilled about it. I didn't say. I was just quoting Paul Krugman, and I was saying that you have uh, a Nobel Prize winner on your side if you want to. Uh, if, if I want to, wait, the, if I want to continue with my theory. <laughs> <laughs> you call up Paul. Bring him on the show next week and see, and he'll be very happy with what you're so saying. So do you the know people, him? The people that it's really hurting the most is the retirees because, you know, 10, 15 years ago, people were working and they saved their money and they assumed that they would put the money in the bank when they retired to get 3, 4, 5% and they could live on that. And all of a sudden, the government is artificially depressing interest rates to basically zero. And now if you're retired, what do you do? Where do you get income? And so what's happening is these retirees are either living a lower lifestyle than they had envisioned or they're having to take greater risk in their investments in order to get more income, which they had formerly thought they would get by putting the money in the bank and just living off the interest from their bank deposits. <clears throat> so, um, well, another, co another important question. Now, this is, uh, again, we are going into philosophical aspects because I want to find out how philosophical you are. Can money bring happiness? What a great question. Well, I, I'm going to quote a friend of mine, Sean Aker, who was a, you know, I have a, uh, Ravi, I have a, a radio show as well. It's called Goldstein on Gelt. Okay. Gelt is the Yiddish word for money. My name is Goldstein, Doug Goldstein. So the show is called Goldstein on Gelt. Okay. And I talk mostly about personal finance issues. And I brought on this fellow. He's a professor at Yale University. And Sean Aker is his name. And I would suggest that everyone listening should, should listen to that interview that I had with him. The easiest way to find it, by the way, is just go to YouTube and look up Goldstein on Gelt and Sean Aker. Because all of our interviews are videos that appear there. Anyhow, so this is what he told me, and I, I think everyone should, should really remember this. He said that up to a certain point when people are impoverished, they are a little more miserable. But once they reach a basic level, which he calculated to be about $70,000 of income every year, there's no difference in happiness between the person who earns $70,000 and, let's say, $700,000. Really? <laughs> so that, if you're looking for a number, target 70,000 and you'll be perfectly happy. Well, That's according to his research. You know, there's a lady by the name of Helen Gurley Brown. She said, money, if it does not bring you happiness, will at least help you be miserable in comfort. <laughs> yeah, or if you like to quote Woody Allen like you did before, he said, people who tell you that money can't buy happiness they're just not shopping in the right stores. <laughs> very interesting, very interesting. You know, but I, I'll tell you what, what really, what, what I've discovered, and I'm, I'm waiting to do more academic research on this, but I've literally spoken to thousands of people about their money in my career, so I feel I'm in a pretty good position to share this, this bit of wisdom. And this is what it is. People who are significant philanthropists People who donate money, and I'm not talking about saying, oh, you know, I wrote a check for $100 this month. I'm talking about people who give between 10 and 20% of the income that they make, 10 to 20% of their income. I believe those people are happier, certainly in terms of their money, because they no longer, they, they get rid of the sense of greed that's in themselves. They're no longer bean counters trying to see how much more money can I accumulate. Instead, they're people who are trying to maximize the good that they do in the world, and they do that by giving away the money they earn. And frankly, some of the richest people I know say that the reason that they're so successful is because they give so much away. You know, very interesting point. In other words, uh, you know, not writing a check to your church or a synagogue or your temple or the mosque, it is more important that you give a significant percentage of it so, so you don't feel greedy or guilty. Okay. That's and I think, by the way, that people who, who don't do that maybe should feel greedy and guilty. Once you realize that you have food on your plate, a roof over your head, and you've got clothes to keep you warm, you've got to realize there are a billion people on this planet who don't go to sleep that way every night. It's time to help, you know? And uh, it's not time to buy yet another TV for your house. 
And so, uh, you know, when I, I heard a, a great, a great speaker, the, the head of a company called IDT, a fellow named Howard Jonas, <clears throat> I must have heard him speak about 15 or 20 years ago. And a major telecom company, he's a gazillion, I don't know how rich he is. And in his speech, he said that he and his wife give 20% of what they earn to charity. And I remember I went home and I said to my wife, I want to be like him. And we started doing the same thing. We kept much more careful budget, so we knew exactly what we earned. And just doing that, by the way, just keeping a careful budget will make you wealthier because you're going to be able to handle your money better. And you'll find that giving away money, apart from the honor of being to help other people, being, you know, being the person who's able to give and not being the person who needs to take, that's a huge honor. And apart from that, you're going to be more financially successful. Absolutely. You know, the greatest, uh, um, wealthiest guys in the U.S., the Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, uh, apparently has given quite a bit, especially Warren Buffett, vast majority of his wealth has given away for charity. Uh, so, the ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, not necessarily for religious reasons, just to keep your head clear. If you have a lot of money, uh, give some to me and Goldstein. <laughs> 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 I'll tell you. I'll tell you one more thing about that. I think is important. Yeah, is try to get when, when you're involved. The, the reason I, I I feel I have a little bit of an expertise in this because um, a division of my company deals specifically with managing philanthropy. We manage the money side of it, and one of the things that we found is that it's good for people. Let's say when they're you know normal people, not Warren Buffett, who it's it's not possible for him to give a small amount of money. It's just because he's got so much to give, but. You know, normal people who may be giving in the thousands or tens of thousands of dollars, they should focus that giving on small charities where they get involved. I don't think you have to give to the huge, multi-mega international charities. Instead, find a local soup kitchen or literally individuals who might need your help to buy winter coats for their kids. Help them out because you can have a much greater impact that way. I remember uh, there was a news in the uh, TV a couple of days back. There is a very wealthy man in somewhere in the U.S. They didn't want to show him where he was, and they didn't want to even show his face. And he was going to the uh, uh, police station and then handed over $100,000 uh, in $100 notes and told all the policemen to go out on the city and just randomly, you know, if you, if you, somebody, if you see somebody driving a car which is all dented, it probably is a poor person. So just stop him, and then instead of giving him a ticket, give him a hundred dollar. And uh, they, I'll tell you, I'll, and they I actually was, I, did a video of uh, these police officers from that city going around in town and handing over money, and that was really heartwarming to watch. What what happened when these people took the you know they they were just absolutely ecstatic and so thankful, and it was all done by a guy nobody knows who he is. Good for him. And he I, does I was it. involved in a very similar case. Okay. I had a woman who, she said she saw this whole community that was literally suffering, and many of the people had lost their jobs and literally couldn't put food on the plate. And she hired a lawyer and a family office to oversee the distribution of envelopes of money that was given out to these families. And she changed their lives. That's fabulous. I love your story, Ravi, and we should only hear more stories like that. Well, you know, th this is what they say, you know, this is money is not the most important thing in the world. Love is. Fortunately, I love money. You know, this is Jackie Mason. <laughs> well, you know, I think you're in the wrong business, my friend. You should be stand up on stage. Stand I should be here. going to comedy. Well, as a matter of fact, you know, before I, you know, I was in India for two years and I, on a personal business. And... Um, and uh, I was uh, in, uh, I was a talk show comedian there for about, uh, we, we ran through national TV and I was the one who was writing jokes and uh, making it, <laughs> and, uh, making the show. Oh. So anyway, I came back, uh, back, came back to US, you know, I, you know, because my son wanted to come back. So I sub I blame my son. You broke my, you ruined my Bollywood dreams. <laughs> Okay, anyway, that's besides one of, one of these days we will talk. So tell us our audience about your radio show. Exactly what do you do? So in my, my day job is that I'm a financial advisor, and I specialize in helping people who live outside the United States open U.S. brokerage accounts who want to have a portfolio in the United States. 
in stocks and bonds and mutual funds. That's the type of work that we do. A lot of the clients that we work with are U.S. citizens, what we call U.S. expats, expatriates, people who've left the United States. But a lot of them are not U.S. citizens at all. Do you know a lot of people think that if they're not a U.S. citizen, they're not allowed to have a U.S. brokerage account? And that's not true. They just need to work with someone who understands how to do it. Well, my company is, yeah. is called Profile Investment Services, and this is what we do. Well, is that the, the address is uh, HTTP? No, Profile, anyway. it's www.profile-financial.com. Okay, now if they, when they go to this website, what do they find? They find what kind of information? Oh, there's tons of articles and tons of... I write a huge amount. I've written a number of books. In fact, I wrote a book specifically for U.S. expatriates because it's a, that group of people has a, have, a, have a very complex investment and tax scene, and I wrote a book about that. So we refer to that on the website. We have lots of articles. There's uh, an advertisement for the new book, Rich as a King, which is curr currently my favorite because I'm a big ch chess fan, and I really enjoyed writing the book. And pe everyone who seems to be reading the book is loving it. We're getting great reviews on Amazon, and, uh, and it's, you know, certainly a lot of critical review, as well as letters from people who say they've really enjoyed it. So you are a chess fan, so you must have been uh, w w watching that. I don't know what happened to him. Uh, um the famous chess champion who who Bobby Fischer against uh, Boris Spassky and Reich Javik in 1972, I believe. And right, uh, right. you know that that was one of the classic game that uh, unfortunately the are fortunately for the Americans and unfortunately for the Russians because the Cold War was just brewing. Somebody has to win. Whoever wins that chess game is won the Cold War. That's about it. That's how hard it was. But coming back to you are uh, you are. By the thing. way, a great book. I just if, if you like that story, there's a book called it's called Bobby Fischer Goes to War. I'm pretty sure that's the title. And it's about all the politics behind that game. Fascinating book. Yes. Really because great. the politics was, it was the height of Cold War. And yeah, whoever yeah. wins the chess game has won the Cold War. That's how bad it was. <laughs> That's anything funny about Bobby Fischer. You know, he wasn't, uh, he had a number of issues with the Americans as well and ended up not being able to return to the United States. And he actually spent a lot of time with my co author, Susan Polgar. Really? And so. <laughs> one of the great things that she has to share when she speaks are stories about Bobby Fischer. So but is Bobby Fischer is a little bit eccentric? Well, aren't we all? Aren't we all? Okay, good. Well, that's the story I I heard. But you know, you know, everybody has their own uh, little quirks, as you as you can see. It now, coming back to this, um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about. Let's go back to talk about richest of rich Americans. Now, the richest of rich Americans don't want to pay tax. Either. Do you want to pay tax? I'm sorry. Uh, no, nobody wants to pay tax. Okay, so it's not just the rich Americans. I'm just clarifying. Well, well, yeah. No one wants to pay tax. <laughs> no one wants to pay tax. But the proportionate share of tax for the rich guys is proportionately high. Or in other words, uh, the actual amount is very high. Now, many of them don't want to be U.S. citizens. There was a trend some time back. And there is a trend. It's growing. It's a growing trend. What 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 do you think that is the case? And uh, you know, coming from the government point of view, the government, the American government, is going to lose a lot of tax, you know, income. Uh, I'm not yeah. I'm not a great uh, f you know supporter of American government in many 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 different issues, but American government is still okay. And it's not bad. But c the question is, if this trend continues, do you suggest or do you advise people to just to say, listen? The best thing you can do is to give up all your citizenship, give up all citizenship from all countries, get on that ship, the residency ship, where it is not going to dock on any kind of uh, port, and you sit there, and you, are, you belong to no country. Is that a better, appro better approach? Well, you have to like being on the ocean. Yeah. I, I don't know. If, <laughs> that's not obvious to me. Listen, the, the problem that the U.S. government has regarding expatriates is that the U.S. government is the only government, well, along with uh, Eritrea, yeah. is the only government which taxes its citizens who live outside their country on their foreign assets. So it's a little bit strange. In other words, they, they don't really have, I don't think, a moral right to tax, but forget the morality of it. But it became so onerous for people who expatriated. They, for whatever reason, they got a job overseas, or they had cultural ties to a foreign country, or they got married to someone foreign. 
And now for the rest of their life, they have to file a tax return and declare all their assets. And if they don't, they're considered criminals. It's so difficult. And then the American government did one more step. They passed a law called FATCA, which, allow, which forces basically every bank and investment company on the planet to supply data to the IRS. You know, it's a little bit imperialistic for the, for the U.S. government to do that. They're not making any friends, let's put it that way. And so a lot of Americans, a lot, are giving up their citizenship, and it seems to be increasing every year. Well, interesting, because if, uh, if the Americans don't want to give up citizenship, can they not just simply tell the American IRS that we, there is no double taxation with the treaty with many of these other countries? So if they pay tax in the local country where they are expats, isn't it good enough? Not always. Uh, first off, not the, there are not treaties with all the countries where Americans live. That's one problem. Another pro I'll give you an example of a real problem. Let's say that you, how many years have you lived in America? About 35 years. Okay, and you've been paying Social Security on your earnings, right? Yes. Good. So now let's say you decide to go live in India. Mm -hmm. And you live there for 10, 15 years, and then you collect a pen, and you retire there. Mm -hmm. A reasonable thing to do, right? People are not forced to stay in one country. Right. And it's a totally reasonable story. I'm not, this is not. Well, there a lot of my friends who are above age 65 has gone back to India, and they're right living they there. And now, and you work there for a while, now you collect an Indian pension. The U.S. government, the Social Security Administration, considers that a windfall. They say, wow, look, you, it's, you are getting so much money from a foreign pension. And as a result, they're going to cut your Social Security, even though you paid into the system. You paid just like everyone else for your 35 years or however many years you paid in. And you expected to get your one or $2,000 a month pension. But now, because you're receiving a foreign pension, the IRS, the Social Security considers that a windfall. It, that triggers the windfall elimination provision, which can cut your Social Security benefits up to in half. So could you imagine you were planning on this money? You paid into the system like every good American, and now they're not going to give you the money that, that you, I think, and is rightfully due you. They don't think so. Do you. So therefore, what they are trying to do is to encourage you to be lazy and sit at home. And well, they're certainly it. discouraging you from leaving the country and spending your dollars in yes, India right. instead of in the United States. Well, there is a there is a there is a really a potential problem for the Americans because nobody likes sovereign states like a foreign country coming and tell them that okay, now please open up your wallet. We want to check and see what's inside. Okay, so that's exactly what the American government is telling to the foreign banks in foreign countries. Uh, well, somebody is going to do something about it. Hopefully that, uh, that will not be a big problem. But unfortunately, what you are saying is correct. If you have too much money, you have certain other problems uh, come with it, you know. Uh, yeah, I think, by the way, I think the, for people who are in, do have wealth or are working overseas, if they're Americans especially, they desperately need to speak to p professionals who specialize in this. A big mistake that Americans make is they, they leave the United States to live somewhere else, and they like their investment advisor in New York or their accountant in New Jersey, and they keep them. And those guys don't have any clients living overseas, and they don't really know the ins and outs of the rules, and then they end up giving poor advice. So if you're going to leave the United States, make sure you work, you change your professional relationships to people who are cross-border experts. Very interesting. Um, coming back to money, you know, we, we were touched on a number of uh, philosophical aspects of money. And, uh, you know, people can have happiness, but uh, love is more important. <laughs> and uh, there was one other thing that I wanted to ask you about. Um, people, when they, when they have money and... Uh, and uh, they want to spend it, and they want to have enjoyment in their life, what proportion of their money they should be allocating so that they don't have to feel guilty enjoying their life? I think people should give up to 20% of their income to charity. Okay. And that alleviates all the guilt. That's it, okay. <laughs> so so save enough, you know, speak with your financial planner to figure out how much you need to save so you can retire comfortably. And have a good time. I'm not one of these. I'm not a, you know, uh, someone who who 
advises you should live and not enjoy day to day and enjoy the benefits of money. I have no problem with that. But after you've given charity, after you've saved, then you, then enjoy, have a great time. Well, you know, they were they did a happiness quotient study, an ac academic study, where they compared the happiness of uh, the people, the, the girls who were uh, spending their life in the uh, red light district in Calcutta, India, and those who are doing their undergraduate degree in Harvard. So they looked at the happiness quotient for these two groups, and they found out there's really not much difference in their happiness quotient. Okay. So sorry, the, the people in the red light district, are you referring to the clients or the... The, the, the actual uh, prostitutes and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the workers. So they were just as happy as the Harvard undergrads. Interesting. Well, you know, I, maybe there is biased. I don't know what kind of uh, system or systematic... It's a pure research, apparently. I don't know what kind of research they did. I know this is not the clients. The clients are probably even more happier. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's very funny. All I... All I know is they become very cynical of statistics, but okay, well, I hear that. Okay, anyway, so that is, that is in other words, money is not everything. Money is the only thing. That's, that's how it comes to, finally. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a fascinating conversation. You know, we haven't, we, you know, it's nice that I was able to talk to you, Doug, about various aspects and everything else. Is there any, any final parting thoughts from your end? What is the, you know, you can, you can plug your books under your ideas and everything else. Yeah. You got a I next, just, to, next to couple I of I just minutes. want to encourage people to really focus on thinking strategically. The book Rich as a King is, uh, this is what we, we use the chess metaphor to illuminate the ideas. And the, the website for the book is richasaking.com. And I mentioned earlier on the show that anyone who wants to access, there's a lot of extra material other than what's in the book. Here's the book. A lot of extra material other than what's in the book online. And so I gave you the, the uh, website for one of the things that we give out for free to people who read the book. And again, that's, that website is www.richasaking.com slash snapshot. And you can use that to make a, uh, the beginning of your financial plan. I'd encourage everyone to do that. And also to feel free to contact me through the website of richasaking.com if you have any questions or ideas. Or, of course, you can buy the book through there as well. Okay, um, and Doug. So, can they find this book in uh, Amazon.com or other Kindle versions? Amazon and and uh, it's actually the the Kindle version is not out yet. So it's coming coming out soon. It's currently available as a soft cover book. There's hardcover available as well, and uh, the, it will be a Kindle book as well soon. Okay, just to, just to make it complete, how much does it cost the soft cover? Uh, the soft cover, the full retail price is nineteen ninety five. But I know that on Amazon, they're selling it for about $15 now. So the Kindle version will be even less expensive. It'll probably be nine ninety nine, dollars is 9 my guess, but I can't tell you for sure. I, I, publisher hasn't told me that yet. So ladies and gentlemen, you know, you can go wrong by buying this book. And it's only a few bucks, and you should read it. You go to that um, uh, richasaking.com forward slash snapshot, and then you go to the online tool, and then start working on it. You know, no matter how where you are you need to know where you are and that is the first step in starting your financial planning am i correct on this absolutely no matter where you go ravi there you are <laughs> that's that's perfect ladies and gentlemen you are listening to uh, global radio and tv live and also our featured guest uh, douglas goldstein he was gracious enough to join us from uh, israel where are you tel aviv jerusalem where are you I'm uh, just south of Jerusalem in Efrat. Oh, Efrat. Okay, good. You know, I've never been to Israel. I would, one of these say, would love to come there and, uh, you know, you I can show I'm me home. around. <laughs> I'd be happy. It'd be a real honor. I hope everyone listening spends some time to come here. Yes. It is the number one vacation spot in the world. Is that on the beach? And there's a beautiful, lots of beautiful beaches. Really? Wow, fantastic. So, so my brother had been to Israel many times, but I've never been there. But anyway, oh. I would love to come there and visit my friends. I have a lot of friends who went to college in the University of Florida, and they went back to Israel. They're in the pharmaceutical business. So I would like to go and meet them. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Uh, Douglas, thank you so much for joining us. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Really appreciate it. I had a great time. And uh, please stay on the line for one more minute. And let me do some paperwork, but uh, we, then we will close out. Uh, please stay on the line.